When Jesus enters the scene, joy is inevitable. Wherever He is, whatever He touches, there's joy. Our lives should be joyful. Church should be joyful. Our families, workmates and strangers should see joy bursting out of our lives. Jesus gives joy and it's the best gift you can give. Which is the time of the season that it should bring joy, isn't it? I know a lot of this world has kind of made it a different feeling and a different responsibility around presents and parties and food and family and there's a lot of stress and pressure. But really when we come back to why we even have Christmas, I know you hear all lots of things of like, oh, this is the reason for Christmas, for family and for giving and sharing. And No, it's not. It is only because of Jesus. Uh, that's why we have it. So I, I like to remind some of my friends who are a bit iffy on the whole God thing that they have a bunch of days off because of God. And uh, they should at least just say thank you for that. Just if they're going to pray, just go, cheers, God, for all the days off that I've gotten. It's the beginning of their journey. But it's such a, it should be a joyful time of year because Jesus brings joy. As you heard Bree say in the video before, that a lot of people that walked away from Jesus walked away a lot more joyful than how they walked up to him. I don't know, like the, the leper comes up to, to him, walks away, healed. Walking away with some joy, yeah? And so... Th- we love looking at this kind of thing, and also a weird one, fun is kind of a value of our church. Uh, choosing joy, have, choosing to have some fun, and no matter what's going on, is something that we hold really important. So we want to have a look at this, because our joy is truly found in Jesus. And we've been looking at this whole thing uh, this month of even choosing joy and seeing joy in Christ, even when all of hell is breaking loose, when things just suck and it's so clear. But I want to kind of look at it a little bit more. Uh, at the moment of Christmas, when we're looking at Jesus here. But let, let me ask a question first, is how many of you have received or even maybe expecting a present that you've been disappointed with? Okay, well, I'm afraid that you've been disappointed with and you've tried to look not disappointed. <laughs> yeah, great. Now, out of you guys, how many of you have a horrible poker face and everyone knew, like, oh, what's wrong with it? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's great. Well, hopefully not this year, but, but I've, I've been given some doozies as a kid. Uh, I, I remember getting some, some just shockers, like, I, like hankies for a child. I don't, I don't even want hankies as an adult. I had nothing worse than a piece of cloth, putting some boogers on it, back in the pocket. I got an avocado de pitter. Even as a kid, I didn't think they were hard to get the pits out anyway. I'm like, why did they invent something to do what a knife already does? I'm just <clears throat> like Hercules. I got, as a, like this is a knife, I appreciate it more as an adult, but as a kid, I got one of those charity goats. You know, like a picture of, instead of buying you a gift, I bought some kid somewhere else who needs a goat, I bought them a goat. And, they got, and I just couldn't understand as a child, why are you showing me a picture of a goat you bought that I can't even play with? It's not even my goat. I appreciate it now going, that's probably a good thing to do. Like I didn't need another Power Ranger or whatever, but uh, the kid definitely needed to go. But at the time I'm like, Why? don't buy some other person a gift and then show me a picture of what you got them instead of me. And I think my favourite one was I, uh, just a bottle of vitamin C. <laughs> just opening that as a kid, you're like... <gasps> Awesome. I don't, I don't know. How, I still don't really know what vitamin C. I just know that any time you kind of kind of sick, someone's like, "Are you taking enough vitamin C?" I'm like, "How much is enough?" <laughs> I don't know. At an orange, I don't want to overdose. <laughs> but sometimes you get gifts that are disappointing. Other gifts come with some assembly required, and these gifts I hate. Uh, I don't want a job that comes with a chore to do it, attached with it. But my wife loves these kind of things. In fact, for the last two years in a row, when you ask her, what do you want uh, as a gift? She will say, gardening things and gardening on the day. Like, what do you want for your birthday? I want to garden. I'm like, I'm not making you labour in the sun for your birth, not for birth. I'm not, I'm not getting you a chore. Like she's in the past asked for like a vacuum cleaner. And I'm like, I'm not that guy because that will get out. That will be fast, like Doug's the husband that buys her, his wife a vacuum cleaner. I'm like, I, but we really, it's so handy, I really want this one, I really like it. Like, you buy it yourself, I am not buying it. 
for you. I'm not that guy. I don't want, I don't want a job that has assembly required. I don't want a job that has some effort. I, I just want the, the complete product finished there. I don't want to be disappointed. I want to be over, I want to be overawed. I want to have expectations here and then she meets it here. Like that, that and she's done it a few times. Oh man, wonderful. Uh, but that, that I like these kind of gifts. And the reason I've kind of been thinking of this this week leading up uh, to talking about this moment of, of Christmas, this moment of Jesus coming was because he was a gift to the world, but he was a gift that was quite unexpected. Like he was expected in the sense that a lot of people knew that, that there was going to be someone who comes and saves, uh, they thought just the Jewish people, that there was going to be a Messiah, maybe on behalf of God, like in the Old Testament. Maybe some even thought that he's going to be someone from heaven, like some people who understood the prophets quite well were like, oh, he's going to come, he's going to be like this, uh, a child of God, spawn of something from heaven that's going to be amazing, come and deliver us. But they all thought, and you see all the way through the Gospels, and you see even into the book of Acts before Jesus left, everyone was waiting for him to deliver them from the Roman Empire that was in charge. Everyone thought that this, whoever this Messiah guy coming at some point is, he's going to be like he's going to be leader of the Rebel Alliance or something. He's going to be a political figure. Uh, he's going to be a king or some power is going to roll in and and just kick these guys out. Uh, but what he, who he came as, was a baby. We, uh, they were kind of waiting for this guy to roll into town, the finished product of something that they thought they would get. But he came as a baby. God didn't send second best. He didn't send a different tactic. He sent his best. He sent himself. Uh, stepped into the scene going, nothing else will do. I'm giving the best that anything has to offer. I'm coming myself. But I'm going to come in an unexpected kind of way. Uh, and, and we see this starting in Luke chapter 2, uh, verse 8. It says, That night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby. Uh, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared uh, among them and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified. Fair enough, I reckon. But the angel reassured them, don't be afraid. He said, I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Saviour, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David, and you will recognise him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. See, and what a lovely story this is, hey? Once you get past the fact that pff, there's an angel just hanging out with these shepherds, and the next verse is all of a sudden, it says a host of angels started just having a sing-along. Uh, so that, like, freaky enough. I just reckon that would be so cool and to stand there and anyone you told this would be like, all right, sure, sure you did, mate. But you get past that. The, the weird thing that we should be picking up here is how it says, this is the sign of the Saviour, yes, the Lord, Messiah. This is the sign that when you get there, you'll know it's Him. And they're like, oh my goodness, we're going to meet this guy. Oh, I'm sure it's the sign is it's this massive palace I never noticed before behind that other sheep. Pfft, it's going to be that big one. Or maybe it's going to be this big celebration. Someone's wrote, like, this is someone significant. There's got to be a sign about his significance. And these are people who have been waiting thousands of years. These are people who have been waiting in silence for a few hundred years now. And all of a sudden, there's a moment of hope. And they're like, here it is. What is the sign? And the sign is there's going to be a baby wrapped in cloth, in rags, in a manger, which is this little hut at the backside of a house that animals are stored in. That's how you'll know the Messiah, yes, this Lord, the Saviour, is here. Now, that is unexpected. That is not how I would picture it. That is a gift with some assembly required. <laughs> not what you are wanting to come through. Matthew wrote a, a similar kind of story about this as well. In Matthew 2, 1 to 2, he says this, Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, who was a mean bit of year. Uh, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem. Magi were uh, like astrologers. They were, other stories call them wise men, but they were from a different place, a different belief, a whole different set of things. But anyway, they saw this star and decided to head that way. Uh, they, sorry, they saw this star, knew that a king had been born and wanted to come and honour 
And so verse 2, it says, they came to King Herod and said, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? Not like him, just made himself king of the Jews. We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. So now this is the best assumption that I could think of. These guys are like, see this star, they go, oh, king born, this is a big deal. There's a king that's been born. We're going to head to where it's happened. And they did exactly what I think 100% of us would have done, going, if a king has been born, where's the biggest palace in town? Who's the biggest deal in this place? Who's the most significant, most influential? Who's the one with the most power? If this is going to happen, if the Jews are going to be delivered, where's it coming? It's going to be coming from that place. I'm going in there. And they rock up to King Herod and pretty much just unknowingly threaten his, his dynasty. <laughs> They're like, where's the one that's been born king of the Jews? In other words, saying you forced your way into this position. It's not yours for long. And you go on and King Herod obviously got a bit threatened, kind of tried to sweet talk them into some things and they escaped. Uh, they got out of that situation and they went along and met little baby Jesus. But just a little side point here, I want to point out the fact that the two of the first, or the first two groups that were invited into the presence of Jesus were the lowest of society and those who didn't even believe what everyone else believed. Like these are the opening stories of who, were, who was told to come closer. I would have picked those who were religious or, or strong in their theology, understanding who the Messiah is, but, but God picked these people and I just want to encourage you that it, no matter where you feel in this whole faith thing, that God's always inviting you closer. Is that you might go, I'm not even sure if I believe this. That's, a, that's all right, because people who didn't quite believe everything about him were one of the first people who said, just come take a look. Come, just get around me. Come and see me. Come, just get to know it a little bit more. And God's extending the same invitation to you as well. And you don't have to say yes to everything, but can you just draw a little bit closer and we'll figure out details on the way because that's how God did just about everything. Oh, I feel being, you might have had a rough past, you might have made some rough decisions, but come on, these shepherds were, were the last people to be invited to anything and they were the first in the presence of the Son of God. This story of heaven invading earth started really small with a baby. Just wrapped in cloth. All I have in my head is like all my dad's oily rags. <laughs> I've never seen a clean rag anywhere near a farm thing. Like I know it's just a manger, but come on, this, this is not the place that I would send my Messiah. The thing about that night is it was a normal night for literally everyone else in the world. I want to see that this was, so we, we put a lot of significance around this birth, but at the time no one did. It was just another birth to a teenage girl who was out of wedlock. It would have been embarrassing, full of shame. It was not a very significant moment for most people. A few people were involved. And we know that it was incredibly significant. At the time, it wasn't really that kind of a big deal. The story of heaven invading earth was quite small and quite out of nowhere. No one knew at the time that the Saviour had been born. No one knew that this was the Son of God now on earth, which is just a pretty big deal. No one knew that he was going to take the burden of sin and bridge the gap between us and God. No one knew he was bringing heaven to earth so earth could go to heaven. No one knew that he was going to leave us the Holy Spirit, that he was going to bring some, something different to our life. No one knew that. He was just a baby. And most people didn't even know that baby was born. His story starts quite quite small. But I just want to remind us that God's small gifts are never insignificant. That if it's a gift from God, it's not insignificant. It might seem small, and I think some of us ridicule our small gifts, but if it's from God, it's never insignificant. In fact, I find more often than not, God starts things in seed form with some assembly required, with some effort put in. Very rarely does he go, here's the end product. There it is. He hasn't done it for me. I am not a finished product. That is one that I am frustrated with him about. <laughs> Can you just sort out these problems? He's like, yeah, sure. Here's your to-do list. Like, <laughs> don't, 
It's like, I have made you with some assembly required, Doug. God specializes in small beginnings. He specializes in small sizes. And See, Jesus is a great gift. He is our saviour, our redeemer, our, our healer. He's the one who empowers us. He gave us the Holy Spirit. He's interceding on our behalf in heaven right now. This is a great gift, but he was also then a baby. A baby that needed nurturing. A baby that needed to be cared for, to be fed, to be wiped to be what it played with. He was a baby and he grew through the stages that every other baby does. And so we, we skip a few se- like seasons in life because they're pretty dull, I would imagine. Little baby Jesus going, chapter 14. Jesus woke up, vomited. <laughs> Pooed again. Wiped, slept. Oh, you know babies. That's, all, that's pretty much all they do on repeat. But he did all these normal baby things. And although Joseph and Mary, they may or may not have had a huge impact onto the character development of Jesus. They might, may not have had a big impact on, on some of his thoughts and behaviours. I'd say a lot of that probably came from Father in Heaven. But, but they did have a huge impact in nurturing him to stay alive. They did have a huge impact in see, making sure that Jesus became the fulfilment, the fullness of the gift. See, the gift was already all there in a seed, just like a tree is fully in the seed. There is no need for other things. The whole tree is in a seed, but it just needs to be nurtured so it can grow into the tree. And I'm saying, perhaps, most likely God would have fed and nurtured him no matter what, if Joseph and Mary abandoned him, like he's done it before in the Bible, he'd do it again for sure. But you can see here that they were given a very good gift for all of us, and they had the responsibility to nurture that gift, to grow it, to make sure that he came into the fullness of that thing. And, and I want to ask you some questions, church, because I think they're important questions to ask ourselves. And it's what gifts are you trivializing right now? What gifts are you seeing as insignificant or, or too small or they're not good enough to really make a difference with? What, what, maybe you've ridden yourself off with significance, especially compared to other people. You look at someone else and go, oh my goodness, like they're, oh, I can't do that. And so we push ourselves down and we make sure that we feel insignificant with the gift that we've been given, with the gifts God's put in us, with everything that we have as an opportunity and resource. And we just go, look, it's not, it's not as much as that, so it mustn't be any worth. What, what about the gift of, of just Jesus himself? What, what do we do with that gift? If you're even just, I spend this time at least once a month, I do it formally, and then throughout the week, I try to look back and go, how did I spend my gifts this month? How did I nurture them? How did I grow? How, how am I going in these areas? What did I do? Here's a great question I ask myself. What did I do with the person of Jesus this week? Which is going to be the question we, we all answer in heaven one day. Because sometimes we can, we can shrink back and, and push our gifts down small. But I love here what Paul is writing to his little protege named Timothy in 1 Timothy 4. He says this, Do not neglect your gift, which was, given, uh, which was given to you through prophecy when the body of elders lay their hands on you. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Now, Paul here is specifically talking about spiritual gifts, which is a great question anyway to ask. But... What kind of gifts are we neglecting? And I love Paul's attitude here to this young guy going, don't forget, Tim, that you have been greatly gifted. Don't forget it. Don't push it aside. I know that it's frustrating now. I know that it feels small now, but don't neglect the fact that it's been given. Don't neglect that there has been something given. Somehow we go, oh, look, it's so small. But we forget that God doesn't do anything that's insignificant, even if it's small. The whole thing might be in a seed. The potential that is in something small is really hard to see unless you know what the end product is. Can I say that God knows your potential because he put it in you. He says, this one requires some nurturing. Oh, if you want to develop as much as other people are, we play the comparison game so often in our life, don't we? But can I tell you that they might be a little further along because they got out and worked it out a little bit more. 
Oh, how come so-and-so always sees miracles? Well, I say so-and-so might pray a little more. I compare myself all the time. You get these people and oh, like I'm around some amazing people of faith and they're in prayer and they're quoting Obadiah something, something. I go, oh, stuff, I, didn't even, I forgot it was in the Bible. Oh, and they're like, oh, Jeremiah said this. I'm like, did he? Oh, I must be an awful Christian. And then I'm like, hang on. They've been reading the Bible longer than I've been alive. Why am I playing, trying to play catch up for someone who's been doing this their whole life? And we start to shrink up our own potential, our own significance, because we feel that whatever we've been given is smaller than what other people have been given. As the Bible says that each one of us have been given a measure of faith. It's a matter of what we do with what we have been given. And I want to encourage you that, yes, we've been given spiritual gifts, amazing. We've been given skills and abilities and these kinds of gifts, which is amazing. But I'd say that there is no greater gift that we've been given than the person of Jesus. To know, to have a relationship with, to, to ha- ask for wisdom, for, for help, to walk through in our journey. We know him as the Holy Spirit a lot, but... This gift was the beginning. Christmas was the beginning. This is why we can have such joy in this season, knowing this is the time I have been given the greatest gift. And I say it all the time, but it's like getting this Christmas present and then just not unwrapping it. And I want to remind us this Christmas, let's open this bad boy up. Let's get stuck into it going, God, if there is something to know about you and there's a bit more to know who you are, I want to open that up. I want to pull back the layers. I want to understand. I want to get all in it, not just peek in and go, oh, that's just a small seed. He's going, if you just got it out. If you just got it, imagine what what could happen. Because it might be small, but nothing from God is ever insignificant. See, we've all been given these gifts, and this is what the word gift here means. It means miraculous faculty, an endowment or an inheritance. Isn't that cool? Now, yes, we've been given this miraculous ability, but also an inheritance from heaven. That's already been something given to us. But it goes on, if you look at more biblical dictionaries and even normal dictionaries, this is neglect. It says, this is what it means, to make light of or have little regard for it, as if it's trivial or inconsequential. Now, I don't ever want to be someone who is given something and feel and take it as inconsequential. I remember I spoke once at a youth ministry on the coast, and this girl came up to me like so fearful and tears in her eyes, and just, I just really feel God wants me to, to give you this, and then handed over a dollar coin and ran away. I'm like, is that for me or was that for her? Or like, a dollar's not really like helping me out heaps, God. But that's kind of a small gift. Like, if you if you're gonna make someone tremble coming up and giving me a gift, put lots of zeros at the end of it, Lord. <laughs> Could have been one thought, but I was just going, oh my goodness, thank you so much. Are you sure? She, like, I felt God said. I said, well, I'm not going to press any more. Thank you so much for listening. To God, this is just such a huge blessing for me. Because I decided to be someone who doesn't take a gift as inconsequential, as trivial, because I know it starts there and it ends with taking the gift of Jesus as if it was just a nothing. I don't want to take the gifts that God's put in me. This is why I, I try to overcome whatever fear I have because I go, this is something that God has put in me. I'm going to get over the fear because it's too important to be held back by struggles and fears and insecurities. What God has put in you is far too important for us to hide for whatever reason it might be. See, I want to encourage you not to fall into the trap that the enemy has got there of making light of the great things that God has done in our world, how that he's put in you. I don't want you to fall into the trap of thinking you are unimportant, insignificant, unnecessary. And this is the categories I find most people in our world put themselves in. As you know, what would it really make a difference to God or to other people if I weren't around? As if it is inconsequential. But I want to tell you that it is incredibly consequential. That it is such a significant thing what God has put in you. This is the gift that we've been given. The person of Jesus is not something that we should ever take lightly. And anything that he's put in us or done through us is nothing we should just just kind of push to the side. This is all of heaven, the fullness of God coming and dwelling with us. 
This is a joyful time of the year. We should never write off our significance to God, our impact that our life or our gifts could ever have in this world. I just have a feeling that some people who you feel that their gifts are not needed. I'll tell you, they are needed. That there are people in this room who are in lack because you're refusing to put in what God put in you. To work that out. Some people feel that their effort isn't noticed. Can I say it is? I know this because I'm confident that God has never made a reject. He's never made a B-rated person, a purposeless person. He's never made someone that he didn't have a, a, a destiny with, an eternal purpose in. He's never done it. You are not his first. He sees every single one of us with this same eternity. Eternal plan. I love it put this way. A friend of mine told me, he said, though you are an object of intentional divine creation. Oh, I, just, I, I feel that some people should write that down and say it about themselves tomorrow. Just make it a declaration. I am an object of intentional divine creation. You might think oh, I'm not worth anything. I'm not significant. No, you are an object of intentional divine creation purpose, not just accidental. Your parents weren't that good. Figure that out. No, that God knew you were coming. See, if you feel small, remember that God specialises in small sizes. If you feel insignificant, let God just tell you that God specialises in small sizes. See, our Saviour came as a baby and He grew through nurturing just as He will in your life if you're willing to nurture Nurture that relationship. Look after it. Care for this relationship. Your significance will grow when you give yourself wholly to Him if you look at that Timothy verse. There might be some assembly required, a little bit more participation on your behalf to get that gift growing. But it's not insignificant just because it seems small. Because it's His presence that is the fertiliser for your significance. This is something that I've learned really consistently and really clearly in my life is any time that I want to make a bigger impact or develop more as a person, work on my confidence and, and I might be able to muscle my way through it, learn some tips and tricks from some great thinkers and authors and understanding how the body works and getting my chemicals all right and getting food and all this self, self-esteem stuff right. But the, the only time that I've seen a, a, a permanent and an actual significant difference is by being in the presence of God more. A direct correlation to my own spiritual well-being and my own time in His presence. In the Word, in prayer, in worship, in church, you, know, you just go, oh, I don't get on with everyone. Well, it's not about them. It is about Jesus and you. <laughs> so don't neglect the small starts because that's where God specializes. Look, Luke 16 says this way, Jesus is saying, if you are faithful in little things, you'll be faithful in large ones. If you're dishonest in little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. Sometimes I think God is saving me from big influence and saving everybody else. <laughs> he's saying, he's like, I'm praying for big things. He's like, Doug, that will kill you. I'm like, no, no, give it to me. Because <laughs> he cares about who I'm going to be, not just what I'm going to have. But so how do we look after this? How do we nurture and not neglect Paul wrote it to Tim. He said, be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to it. See, diligent here means care for, to tend to it, to value what God values, not trivialising it. See, would we value the things God values? Would we care for it? Would we tend to it? Could you imagine Joseph and Mary not looking after little baby Jesus? Just going, ooh, let's get away from this sticky situation right now. Let's leave him here with the, the cows. See what happens. A couple of camels, they're good mums, they're fine. Could you imagine what that, like, first of all, that would have been awful for them, but all of us would be there going, oh my goodness, can't, like, because it'd probably make a different version of the Bible. <laughs> Just imagine that, them neglecting the Son of God. I don't want to be found guilty of doing the same thing with Jesus in my life. I want to be someone who is nurturing of God's relation, of this, what I've been given, of this opportunity to know Him, of this opportunity to be able to put the right steps through so I might reach my destiny that He gave me. 
I want to be someone who nurtures that seed that has been put in me that it might grow. See, I know that there are some people here who are feeling a bit stale, maybe spiritually stale or just stale in life. And and I'm confident that it would come back to the same reason that I feel stale. (laughs) So you're not nurturing the gifts that God gave you. You're not nurturing the that relationship. You're not nurturing the person of Jesus yourself. So you might go, no, no, Doug, it's this terrible preaching. <laughs> That's why I'm stale, because there's no spirit in the place. <laughs> Rubbish. We don't do tremble anymore. That's why. <laughs> I used to get the feels with tremble. <laughs> no, it is about how we nurture about how we find delight in God. See, I find that nurturing is, is enjoyment and finding delight in His presence and neglect looks a lot like just obligatory because I have to. But can we come back and just try to find nurturing in this, the gifts that God gave us? Maybe we've stopped living for purpose and we've just started existing. Maybe where our time and our life is being put is something that is starving us from God. And that's an important distinction because we don't starve Him of us. We starve ourselves of Him. And if you're feeling a bit spiritually malnourished, that's something that you can actually work on. That you're, in, you're actually in charge of feeding yourself. And then that's the church's job. No, it is biblically your job. Maybe we're just making light of the gift of Jesus in our life when in fact it's the greatest gift that we've ever been given. And let me just say that if you are willing to accept and open up that gift that God put before us and going, okay, it's Christmas time. It's about little baby Jesus. Maybe there's a small seed around here somewhere. Maybe I want to open up again this relationship with God. And now I've got something that's small and I could easily just put back and move on with life that I was doing before. But no, no, I'm not going to neglect what I've been given by God. I want to nurture this. I want to put some time into this. I'm going to take time away from those things. I'm going to put time into this thing again. And I'm going to start, as Brie and Josiah have known well now, is that I've got to stop thinking about other things. I've got to run a lot of things through this. <laughs> when you're nurturing some, an infant, a baby, of going, and nearly every decision comes through. How, do, how does that affect this? Can I do that? No, I'm going to focus on this. I, I just wish that we, we as a church could come back and just realise nurturing our relationship with Jesus is just as important as nurturing any other thing. And that we look after this and just go, I'm going to run my thoughts through this. I'm going to run my life through this. I'm going to grow this seed because this is where my significance is going to come from. This is where I'm going to find joy that lasts through suffering, that goes through all the rot. In this relationship with Jesus as I'm nurturing it right here is where I'm going to find my destiny. I'm going to find my purpose. I'm going to find my place. I'm going to, in the, in the future, I'm going to need a miracle and here is where it is found. So I'm not going to leave it in seed form. I'm going to grow this thing. I want to see this grow because if this relationship grows, I'm someone who's going to grow. I'll have more, I'll be more, and I'll see more in my life. If we nurture the gift that God is giving us, and the most significant one is the gift of Jesus. So this Christmas, when you're around a tree and you're opening presents, can I just encourage you or hopefully put this in your head that it might flash up of going, just Jesus, thank you that that you are my best gift this year. You are my best gift every day. As much as I appreciate these Apple products and whatever, I'm gonna make sure that I nurture you far more than I nurture any of these things. And this relationship, everything that you put in me, God, help me work it out. Maybe some assembly, maybe some participations required in this. But I'm not insignificant. I'm not inconsequential. I am not unimportant. It might be small, but you specialise in small. Thank you, Jesus. Let me pray for you, church. Father, I thank you. Lord, that you see every single one of us as necessary, that we didn't sneak up and surprise you at all in our life, that you knew that we were coming. You saw us well before we were ever conceived. You knew that we were here. Lord, Ephesians says that before the formation of the world that you, 
you had plans for us to do good. Lord, you saw a need in the future and you said, I better send them. I've got to put them in the world. I've got to make sure that they are there because the world will need what they have in them. Lord, there might be small seeds now, but help us work it out, Lord. These bits of faith, let us help it grow in us, Lord. No matter how we feel about ourselves today, it is not who we are. And I'm so thankful that when you look at me and I'm focused on, on my problems and my, my shortcomings and my where I fall, Lord, that you can see who I am. Lord, help me get into line with who you say that I am and for everyone here. Father, I pray that their ears are open, their eyes can see the that who you made them to be. And I'll thank you that you specialise in small. Lord, that you grow from there. Help us nurture in Jesus' name.